Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I can tell that some of you are into this Neighbors Sermon series because you've either spoken to me or written me or in one case someone sent me a picture of of what it is like, love your neighbor who doesn't look like you, think like you, like, love like you, speak like you, pray like you, vote like you. Wow. Love your neighbor. No exceptions. We might have to get back to that one next week as we talk about who do I love. This week, we're talking about how do I love. It's not always easy to love neighbors, is it? We've all had one of those neighbors, haven't we? I can talk about this neighbor because they're a neighbor from up in Virginia that I had. We lived up on a hill, and it was what they would call a pipe stem. Uh, I never knew what a pipe stem was before I went to Virginia. It's just an excuse to throw more houses in the development. But it's a private driveway, several different houses there, three, four houses. And that that neighbor, I was almost going to say friend, not a friend, but that neighbor's name was Roger. Roger was a very difficult neighbor hard to love. One time when my father-in-law was backing up out of our driveway, his tires in his car touched Roger's grass by about that much. Roger came running out of his house, you touched my grass, you touched my grass, you touched my grass. And I'm sure I and my father-in-law and whole family were just thinking, we love you, Roger. Our encounters with Roger continued right up until the day that we moved out to move down here. My wife moved her car out of the way so that the moving truck could come up the the steep pipe stem, that driveway, that private driveway, and Roger said, this is a driveway that's owned by everybody. He said, you're in my part of the driveway. You need to move. And my wife... She doesn't lose her cool often. And as she pulled away, the tires barked a little bit, let's say. And Roger said, you have damaged the driveway. You know, though, I could tell just by the way Roger riled people up and interacted with others, that there's probably something more going on there than what we could ever know. So I did pray frequently for Roger, and occasionally used him as a sermon illustration. One time, wouldn't you know, Roger came up to me, shocked me, and he said, I have to ask your forgiveness. Now, when someone's just talking and they say, I want to say I'm sorry, that's kind of what the world does, right? We easily say that we're sorry. I tell my kids that when you say you're sorry, I kind of interpret it as you're sorry you got caught. But in this case, when he came up to me and said, will you forgive me? I thought to myself, perhaps those prayers for Roger." are having some sort of effect. Our neighbors need to know love, the best of them and the worst of them. And so how do you and I love? Well, we get it straight from the Savior's mouth. The words of Jesus when he's being quizzed about the greatest commandment. And many times when Jesus is being quizzed by one of the teachers of the law, they are looking for him to say something that is going to get him in a little bit of trouble or get him trapped. And so of all the commandments, which is the most important? Asked the teacher of the law. And Jesus said the most important one is this. See, From Jesus' words, we're going to see how loving our neighbor, to love someone, is a spiritual endeavor. It is an activity that the Spirit cultivates in us, 
and it engages every part of our being. Let's look at Jesus' answer. It's simple. Love God, love your neighbor. It's not always easy. Jesus said, The most important commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Straight from the words of Jesus, love is something that involves our entire being as God calls us to love Him first, foremost, with every bit of who we are and what we have, with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. It sounds easy, simple, but it's not easy. And to love our neighbors as ourselves. To place their needs above our own. To care about them more than we care about our own pride. Love is no easy task in this world. So as we talk about love, and as we have the example of Jesus, to know Jesus is to know love. If you want to know what love is, ultimately, if you want to know what God's love is like, you need to know God's love in Christ. God is love, and he's made his love known to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is a living demonstration of what God's love is like. If anyone wonders what God's love is like, all we need to do is look to or point to Jesus, who is the one who exhibited God's love in the fullest measure. He, as God loves, it is the essence of his being. God is love. And so Jesus, in his very being, his every action, his every deed, his every word, demonstrates God's love to perfection. And so God's word says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Those are loaded words. It doesn't just speak of how God has demonstrated his love in Jesus Christ. But that last phrase That he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You know, that's theological language that is of tremendous depth. And perhaps as we think about love and God's charge for us to love, it's easy for us if we look into the mirror of God's law and as we think about how we've related to other people, how we've spent time, what we've thought about people, including how I thought about Roger, what we think about people who are not like us, how we approach people who rub us the wrong way, perhaps we need to take a step back and acknowledge that we have not loved as God has loved. We have not loved perfectly, and have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. That's why so many confessions of sin include that type of language. What hope could there be for us if this is this love that we naturally exhibit to people who are like us or do like us or treat us well? What hope would there be for us if that was only the type of love that we have? There's hope for us because God knew that you and I could not perfectly love 
anyone, not even our own flesh and blood. Perhaps even when we look in the mirror, we don't love ourselves very much. But he sent his son Jesus Christ to be this atoning sacrifice, this covering for our sin refers back to the Old Testament when they would sacrifice a lamb on the Day of Atonement so that the people's sin would be atoned for, covered over, so that God would not see it any longer. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, has given himself for us. He comes not just to demonstrate that God is love, but to demonstrate that love in the most remarkable way. As the sinless Son of God, he changes places with us so that on the cross, he takes the penalty and the punishment for our sin. And from there, God's word says that we are to love as God has loved us. Why is this all so important? It is because by God's design, by a divine design, God has made it so that in this world, if people want to know his love, if people are to know and experience his love, they will experience it through the people of God. That's you and me, people. That we are, by God's design, his agents, his conduits, through which his love flows into the lives of others. And that's what those next words of 1 John chapter 4 talk about. Dear friends, since God loved us, so also we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Think about that. No one's ever seen God, so how are they going to know what God's like? Nobody's ever seen God, and sometimes it seems like words just aren't enough. No one's ever seen God, but in our practice of love, they experience God's love, and they experience His power, and lives are changed. Friends in Christ, love is something that must be practiced, done, exhibited. Even as God's word says in chapter 3 of 1 John, Dear children, not a, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. We have a way of saying this, right? Actions speak louder than words. How are you and I going to practice this love this week? Well, my hope is that this sermon isn't just theoretical, isn't just something that dwells on the, the, the theological, but that there is something practical for you and me. Someone sent to me this week uh, an article from the web called Seven Ways to Love Your Neighbor as Yourself. And I kind of picked up on that. I thought, this is practical. This is something that I can do. Not that God desires that I would check things off my list and then come back to him next week and say, God, aren't you proud of me? I loved everybody just the way I should have. But rather, these are starting places for us to engage those who are our neighbors. And neighbors, that means anyone that we encounter, whether it be in our neighborhood in the grocery store, in our workplace, at the ball field, wherever we might be, wherever we live, wherever we recreate, wherever we gather. Seven ways to love your neighbor as yourself. And I will say this, if, uh, if Jerry Lemke put these in the right place, they're printed for you so that you can see them. Take, a, take one of them as you grab one of those family and youth prayer sheets as you exit today. So first of all, seven ways to love your neighbor as yourself. Number one, I'll see my neighbor. 
I'll give attention to them. I won't be busy with my own life. I won't just be focused on what I need to do, the tasks of, all, of life or the things that go on day by day by day. I will find a way to see my neighbor, even if they are among those who simply pull into their garage, close the garage door, and no one ever sees or hears from them again. I will look for an opportunity and I will take them into my heart as I look for them with my eyes. Number two, I will ask for forgiveness and I'll offer it. First of all, I'll ask my Heavenly Father for forgiveness because I get so wrapped up in myself and my own things and my own wants and own needs that I forget to love. I will ask my Heavenly Father for forgiveness because so often I tend to look at people and I think, well, you know, I wish they had their life a little more together and I might look down on them the way at times I looked at Roger and thought, what a person. That's the word I used, right? I will ask forgiveness. I will ask forgiveness for my neighbor and I will do the hard work of offering it. Thirdly, I will pray. Whether I know what my neighbor's going through or whether it's just simply I think about them, I see their house, maybe I don't even know them, I will pray that God gives me an opportunity to know them so I can share God's love with them. I will pray. I will pray for them, asking that God would shower his blessings on them, I will pray for them as I get to know them and I see them. I'll pray for their needs. I will pray. Number four, I'll rejoice and mourn. As I get to know them, they will have, my neighbor, high points and low points. I'll walk with them. I'll join them. I'll rejoice with them when they rejoice. I won't try and convince them that they shouldn't be sad or mourn, but I will mourn with them when they mourn. And I will offer hope that only comes through Christ. Number five, I'll learn and be teachable. Because my neighbor is not just like me. I'll learn what they're like. I'll learn what their values are. I'll get to know them. I'll think about what they say. Even if it's something that I don't agree with. Even if they start talking politics and they are far away on the other side of the aisle. I'll listen. I'll learn. I'll be teachable. I'll share because I love. I'll ask hard questions about myself. Why do I think what I think? Why do I behave the way I behave? Why do I do the things that are just the status quo? How can I love better? And finally, I will love them with such a love that will withhold judgment, but will also be such a love that will encourage them and spur them on to live as Christ lived. I won't judge their lifestyle, I won't preach at them, but in conversation I'll share what God's design is for life and love, faith and hope, because I care about them. It's simple but it's not easy. But in doing so, I'll fulfill God's design. Because the way God loved me was He didn't wait for me to get my act all together. Rather, He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, and He has sent you and me into this world to love like He loves. No one's ever seen God, but prayerfully, in the love that we extend, they will see God through us. In Jesus' name, amen.